Well, welcome everyone to the Lady Mo Evening Show. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. If you have not shared the video, please go and share the video with all of your friends and family. I guarantee you tonight is going to change your life. Um, it's changed my life. We're going to be talking about mental health. And we have some extraordinary um, guests tonight that they're professionals. Hello, how are you, Terrence? Um, in the field of mental health. And we all deal with mental health. Uh, we have people in our family. Oh, hello. Hola. We have people that are in our family, our friends that suffer with mental illness. So as we just say hello to everyone and asking everyone to share the video, share the video, share the video. And I was going, well, I'll wait till my guests come on. They are in the green room waiting for me and I'm waiting for some more people to sign on and to share the video. Again, I am Lady Mo Johns and this is the Lady Mo Evening Show. We're gonna be talking about mental health. It's important that we talk about this topic or I should say for some, it's a way of life and some people have been dealing with mental uh, health for years. When I say mental health, I mean depression, anxiety, mental illness, bipolar. Um, so we have some experts here that are going to shed, share and share and shed some light on things that perhaps to the community that we're not aware of. We watch the news, um, but it isn't until it hits us home or someone close to us or someone that we knew we had a relationship with that we begin to open up our eyes. I gotta make sure I share because I keep forgetting. So let me see if I didn't share this. Let me share one more time. I'll make sure I don't think I did. Mental health. Um, so it's important that we um, talk about this topic and get some understanding. It's important to get understanding. When you when you have understanding and knowledge, it's, it's easier for you, for anyone. Yes, it's going to be good. You are right, Letha, it is going to be good. When you have an understanding of, of, of an individual, of a symptom or an addiction, it's it makes it easier for you to dissect and understand and translate and help. It's just easier. So we're gonna get some understanding. Um, the pandemic has, in this field has, has exploded, or I should say um, opened up more now. We are, we are looking at people who have been dealing with mental health for years, but now the pandemic has exposed because now you're in a confined space. Maybe people aren't able to get the counseling in person, they have to do it virtual. So our guests, our, our experts are going to fill us in and give us some knowledge that we need to fight mental illness in many areas. If you have questions, please type them in when I say questions, because as the screen moves that I won't be able to see in my assistant, um, it's not here tonight. So um, I'm gonna need your help tonight. So when I say questions, questions, Please type it in then, and then I will be. We'll, our guests will be able to answer the questions. And also, if you're going, if you need to reach out to our our guests, um, they will give you their information, and we'll type that in. So if you need to contact them outside of tonight, um, so we're going to get started. I'm going to bring our guests in. I'm excited. One more time, make sure you're sharing the video. Make sure you're sharing the video. Um, welcome you to. Hello, welcome Facebook, welcome Periscope, welcome all those that are listening, um, maybe with a friend or a family, or you, you just, you're in for a treat tonight. And not just a treat, this is something that we need to talk about. I'm gonna um, bring our guests in, but before then, before I do, I wanna talk a little bit about my experience. Um, I've dealt with depression for years. I did not realize that it was depression. The way I was raised is, you know, you go and 
you pray about it and you talk to someone that is close to you that you trust about how you feel. And I remember um, when I had my first child, I remember laying in the floor, I would nurse her, put her back in, in the cradle and go back to my spot. And I would just rock in this spot and just cry and cry. Some may say postpartum depression. Um, I don't think it was postpartum, part, postpartum depression. I think it was just depression. I had a lot that I was thinking. I was disappointed in you know, getting newly married. And then four months later, I was pregnant. So it was like my life had ended. Like all my dreams, my goals um, that I had planned for my future, I felt that it was over you know and it, it was it was so devastating to me i just couldn't snap out of it now i kept having babies <laughs> i just i kept saying why does this keep happening to me because um my plan was okay this happened this first child is here i'm just going to take her with me and we're going to go and explore the world and it didn't turn out that way so i went through periods and i, I still have periods even now that I struggle with depression um, and I'm a very transparent person. So I don't mind sharing because what you share with your experience will help someone else. So I have some techniques that I have learned through maturity and growth on how to get myself out of um, that state of depression. So um, we're going to talk about anxiety, depression. We're going to talk about bipolar, talking about counseling. Um, our guests are going to just educate us. We need to be ed educated on how to handle um, mental health. You know, there's so many um, tools that are, are here now um, that it's easier for us to access. So I want to make sure that you have the uh, understanding and be equipped and even to have, have the knowledge to reach out and get help. And by, by that, I'm saying to be transparent. That's why I'm transparent with you. Um, so I can encourage you to get counseling if that's what you need. And it's important. So I'm going to bring in our guest. We have Erin Frederick. And she is going to introduce herself. And we have Eric Robinson. So when you're at home, just welcome them. Just clap and say, welcome to the Lady Mo. Uh, show as I make the adjustments here with my screen. I'm going to make some adjustments with my screen. Okay, yeah, I like that better. Hello, Erin, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm fine. Hello, Eric, how are you? I'm good, and you? I'm fine. Thank you so much both for, for coming on the show this evening. I know that I am, um, I'm smiling, but in my heart, it, you know, it's just, this is one of those subjects or topics that it's uncomfortable um, to those who don't like to talk about things like this, but it's a reality um, in our society. So we have to talk about it. So Aaron, I'll let you go introduce yourself first and then we'll have Eric introduce himself. All right, hi, my name is Aaron Frederick. Um, I'm a nationally board certified counselor and licensed professional counselor of mental health in the state of Delaware. Um, I work uh, part-time at an outpatient practice, um, you know, doing therapy with individuals who deal with mental health and substance abuse, and um, also have a full-time job um, working with incarcerated individuals mm. in the mental health field. Thank you. Eric? Uh, my name's Eric Robinson. I'm a master level social worker with certification in drug and alcohol counseling and basically what's considered uh, certified supervision. Basically, I train other people in our craft, our field. Uh, I work full time in a in prison setting with mentally uh, SMI, like severe mental illness and mental illness and behavioral health issues. And I work part time a couple places with uh, at risk youth who have a number of mental health issues from hyperactivity to uh, like mild or moderate depression. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much both for tuning in. Um, you know, welcome our viewers from Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. Welcome to the Lady Mo Evening Show. We're going to be talking tonight about mental health. And um, 
I was calling it mental illness and I was corrected by Lieutenant Governor who told me that we don't say mental illness, we say mental health. So we're gonna be talking about mental health. So let's talk about, as you heard me mention about depression, um, what's been your experience? Well, let's talk about first the children. Um, I wanted to wait a week and a half to broadcast um, and to take this broadcast because my my daughter, someone in her school a week and a half ago, um, took their own life, a senior. And that was, it just, it hit me. I know we hear about it all the time as parents that, you know, kids are having challenges. Um, but you were thinking a 12th grader, you know, about to start his life. Um, you know, what, what have you seen or, or what's your experience on um, with the children, I want to bring Giovanna in so she can talk about what she's been experiencing. But what's been your experience uh, dealing with the youth and depression? Um, I think uh, for me, when I've worked with adolescents and teenagers, a lot of times um, the depression is masked by other things. So it's very difficult mm -hmm. to actually see it or recognize it. And unless you know what you're looking for or um, really are almost trained to to see it, it can be very difficult in kids. You know, it it looks different than it would be in an adult. And in an adult, like we can go seek help on our own where, you know, youth and adolescents and children, they need us to help them. They need us to help identify it and and find them services or the help they need. So as a parent, what do you tell the parents that are um, the child says that, you know, I don't feel good, or you see how their behavior is changing their, the way they dress and how they talk. How, what do we do as a parent? Because you just said that, that the children depend on the parents to identify the depression. And I think that many parents were missing it. So what are some of the signs that we need to, to be aware of, or our eyes should be open so we can see what needs to be seen? I think um, one, my fault. Go ahead. Go ahead, Eric. Uh, I think one of the easiest things to do, because as Aaron expressed it, it can mask itself and look different depending on a number of things, your your kids' development, so forth and so on. What you're looking for is a break in their routine. You have a happy, joyous, outgoing, sociable child, and you see them become withdrawn for a period of time. If you have a <clears throat> a relatively quiet and uh pretty calm child they get hyper and they're taking risks so you're just basically looking for a break in their norm whatever their norm is or whatever they typically do if you see uh, <clears throat> them just doing things that does not fit what you normally see them do it's time to kind of have a conversation with them and uh be careful i think one of the things and i was thinking about this when you was talking I think parent education becomes a big thing. And what I mean by parent education, we, we have to do a better job as parents of educating ourselves about the things that our children face and having conversation with them that may be difficult for us. Like we may have difficulty with the conversation, but if you lack the understanding of what your child may be exposed to or what they may go through, even the language you talk to them with could be harmful to them. So you got to be mindful of that too. And and I know that I was hiding my depression from my kids for so long because they were small. But as they got older, they would see a shift. It, it wouldn't even, I don't, I don't even know if it was just the spirit they saw in me. Um, I didn't say anything. I looked the same, but they would say, mom, what's wrong? And I would say, oh, nothing. They said, oh no, something is wrong. So, you know, how do you, help your child if you yourself is in that state i think one of the things is again too <clears throat> we always think that children don't have the maturity depending on how old they are to deal with or handle certain things there's mm -hmm. a difference between giving them too much information depending on their the way they look at the world and how they process information but there's mm -hmm. also kind of as a parent where we make mistakes and we don't share with them. For example, it's nothing wrong with saying to a child, mommy or daddy has times where they don't feel like doing anything. Okay. You know? 
uh, the word they use to describe that is depression. So that would be for like a seven or an eight year old. Like, you know what I mean? It's not like mm -hmm. I give them a ton of information, but the thing is, and really think about it, kids are empathic, even though they may not have the words to express or understand expression of what goes on, they're empathic and they can feel something is wrong with you. So like mm -hmm. not having that conversation becomes harmful because in our minds, we think we're protecting our children when in reality, we're making them susceptible and putting them at risk for the very things we struggle with because we don't have any conversation about those things. You got to, they call that, you got to peel the veil back sometimes. You got to have some honest dialogue in your house about the very things you struggle with because most often if we struggle with them, our children may tend to struggle with some of the same things. Wow. Okay. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's that's a good point to have. So keeping that, that line of communication and transparency um, open when they get get to a certain age. Now, Aaron, Aaron, what's been your experience um, with dealing with parents that, or just individual adults that um, suffer with depression? And um, raising children. I've seen some, some women um, dealing with depression and I'm thinking to myself, how are they raising those kids? Because they look so defeated. And I'm saying to myself, I work so hard to camouflage and to deal with my depression uh, myself and not to try to expose my kids. I'm wondering what are the kids thinking when they see their, their mother, or their father just in that state? Hmm. So, so a lot of times, um, like you said, the parents mask it. They mask it to the best of their ability um, or basically push through until they have their own time to, you know, deal with it or release, but you know, it's something the kids pick up on it. They notice it. And mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, a lot of the children I've worked with, they think they're doing something wrong. They think oh. it's because of them. Wow. Okay. Wow. And maybe not to some huge extent, but they're kind of like, you know, why is mommy always like in the room and doesn't want to talk to me? Like sometimes they do personalize it to, you know, the point where that's all they can understand it to be. Um, until maybe they're at an yeah. age where they do, like Eric said, you can have those more open conversations about what it really truly is. Wow. Is there anything else you want to add in you to uh, Eric or Aaron about depression before I move on? What, what is anything else that we need to, oh, we should talk about getting the counseling because I think that we deal with depression um, like we deal with most things. We just let it go and, and hope for the best. Um, how, what's the percentage of people that you are counseling that are dealing with depression or just need somebody to talk to? Cause I think that for me, even for me, I, I thought I just needed someone to listen to me, to just hear what, why I was depressed and to say that was, that's a good reason to be depressed, but I couldn't find anybody to say that was a good reason to be depressed. So I just didn't talk to that particular counselor anymore. So I had to find somebody that I was comfortable with. So you think, do you think that when you're dealing with depression, that just being a good listener is the key for the counselor? What should we be looking for when we are looking for someone to reach out to for depression? Um, I think there's like a wide range of resources in the community. And honestly, I think it's meeting the person and giving it a shot. I think a lot of times, um, you just have to be open to it and, and you have to meet them. And sometimes people vibe and sometimes they don't. Um, in my own personal experience, like that's how I've felt, you know, a therapist was good for me is basically, you know, giving it that chance, having that session and being like, okay, where, where do I feel this person's at for me? Like, were they mm -hmm. accepting of what I said? You know, did I feel judged? So sometimes we think about those things, but it's really like kind of the vibe that you get from that person. That's truly mm -hmm. how I perceive it to be. Okay. Do you think is it gender specific or is, is it a, for a woman, woman to woman, or is it better? Um, I think that's like, um, pretty much different for each person. I think it deals, okay. It, it depends on kind of maybe if you have trauma relating to a male or female, maybe you wouldn't want that gender or maybe that's what's going to help you like work through your trauma. It really all depends. Mm -hmm. um, and age comes into that, too. Like I know, you know, 
I don't want a therapist who's younger than me. So <laughs> it's kind of just those things that you kind of think about and you kind of know what you're comfortable with as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Eric, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, I pretty much agree with what Aaron's saying. The only thing I would add to it is I think once you, you need to be looking for connection. Like there should, you should feel some level of connection. For example, people in our field always talk about you need to build a rapport with the person. Before you even get to build rapport with anybody, you have to trust that the information they share with you and the information that, you, that you're sharing with them is both heard but you can also like, can they listen to me and hear me without being biased or kind of coming at me in a critical manner? And can I trust that the information they share with me is something I really want to hear and I'm willing to do if I'm not in their presence? A lot of people go and they may have a bad experience in therapy and they feel like it's a professional and I'm paying the person and they should be able to help me when in reality, the person is just not a good fit for you. There's like, for example, I have children that have done therapy because I'm in the field. I'm kind of aware of certain things. Of course, I don't try to therapize them or give them therapy, but I kind of know what works best for each of them. So I might say that person, ah, and I'll talk to them about that and give them uh, enough information to make their own choices. But I think connection is extremely important. Like you, okay. you have to feel like the person at the end of the day is capable of helping you. And and I'll be honest, I think in our field, there is such variety in how we are as clinicians that you need to be mindful that the person is helpful and a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I'm going to bring Giovanna on um, because she's a young, young girl and she has suffered with some um, depression. And it took me a while to tell her that I understood. Um, and when I told her that, it seemed that her whole disposition uh, shifted. It seemed like it was, it felt like she felt that, wow, okay, there's something that someone else, and maybe it came from you, mom. So it took the pressure off of her. So hopefully she's on here. I don't see her face. I don't know if she wants to put her face on or not. Oh, there's her face. Okay, she's chewing. Hi, Giovanna. How are you? Hi, I'm good. That's good. Uh, welcome to the Lady Mo Evening Show. Um, I was just telling our guests and our viewers how um, it took me a long time to tell you that I suffered with depression. And um, just share a little bit about uh, what do you think kids are going through and, and what what how as we as parents can help um our kids in this time um well i feel like sometimes it depends sometimes it really depends on like the school because school has a big part in personally mine and a couple of my friends so we get overloaded with schoolwork and then we slack off because we just feel like we can't do it and mentally can't do it and I feel like it's harder for parents to admit like, or even notice their kids have it or even come to the realization that their kid is depressed because they believe like, some parents do believe like, you're young, you don't really understand what depression is. You don't really know how it works and how your mind works. So some parents don't believe it. So I think that's like one of the main problems because kids get so doubtful because they feel like there's nobody there and they, end up either hurting themselves or hurting people around them because they feel like there's no one there because no one wants to listen or no one wants to believe them in any of their situations they're talking about. So what can we do as parents? I guess just accept it and, and give you counseling. So what, what, what would you tell um, a parent to do to help? Um, I would say the first step is realizing that depression can happen in young kids and not just old people like older people so it's harder for <laughs> it's harder for some parents to understand that but i feel like that's the best step because some people are in denial and it puts and it makes the child feel more insecure or just they feel alone in that scenario because they feel like nobody is there to even talk to them so they feel like they 
aren't aren't needed in the world at the end of the day because no one really wants to believe what they believe that that they're actually going through something like that. So how has counseling helped you um, deal with the depression? Um, it's helped in a lot of ways because it helps me kind of realize where it comes from, where it comes from in a sense, and when I can see it and start my, I can start seeing myself like going to my room, turning the light off, sitting in the dark, then that's like a sign that I could be in there for a couple of hours. So he's trying to help me get out of that area of my room as my comfort place, but it actually makes me even more upset in scenarios. So outside is a good way that he helps um, me. And he said he helps other kids going outside and animals help too. Um, walking your animals, going outside, talking to family members, even when they don't want to be bothered. Sometimes it does help you. They just, and they gives you a bunch of different, a lot of people have cell phones now. You can use apps and you can track your mood every day and you can do activities that can improve your mood. So therapies, it's good for me because I, at before I didn't realize what, why I was sitting in my room 24 seven in the dark, not wanting to talk to anybody. And it, he really helped me realize that sometimes that even when you feel like you don't have anybody and you feel like you just want to quit it all, that you have people who actually are there to talk to. You just feel like sometimes even in the kids, you feel like your parents won't understand, so you don't say anything at all. And that just puts a damper on your situation and not just theirs. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, because you're you're helping some other kids and you're, you're helping the parents, so now they can recognize and see um, some of the things that the kids are going through, and they'll begin to say, "Oh, wow, maybe you know I should talk to them." But thank you so much for being so open and transparent. Take care. Thank you. So that was Giovanna. <laughs> that was Giovanna sharing her her uh, insight and her story on how. Um, I, I, when I told her I had experienced depression, it's like she snapped out of it and was so excited that she wasn't alone and she could blame me, which was great. So blame me, you know, it makes you feel better. So, um, we're going to go to the next thing. What, since this is black history month, can we talk about some statistics for, uh, for Latinos or Brown people? What's the statistics when we're dealing with mental health? But before I go there, I had this question I don't want to forget. Is mental illness um, and addictions on the same area? Do they coincide? Can, I mean, can like, you repeat the question? Like, are they similar? Do they go together? Yeah. Are they like in the same family? Um, I would say yes. Um, but that's also kind of how I was trained and educated. So like, okay. you know, my experience has taught me that a lot of times they, they do either go hand in hand, but yes, I would say they're in the same family, although addiction, um, a lot of times honestly stems from some kind of mental illness or some kind of trauma. Okay. Um, so I would say that's probably the biggest connector. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the times there's something, you know, when you have a substance use addiction or something else, it stems from something more. A lot of times mm -hmm. it's something related to mental health. Okay, thank you. Eric, did you want to add something to that? Uh, no, I, I was curious uh, about it. Say it again? I was just curious about it. It was there a connection. There, there is a connection. Uh, <clears throat> And like basically, like if you ever looked up anything by the American Psychiatric Association, you can see the literature that connects the two. But uh, I kind of wanted to talk about and I guess connected to this. Giovanna says something I think that's really important when you look at statistics for black and brown body people. If you put the cities of Houston, Philadelphia and Chicago together, that's actually the number of brown body people that suffer with mental health issues. Mm. That is three major cities. So you're talking about over 7 million people. 
And that's just people that are diagnosed, people that have gone or attempted to uh, stay engaged in treatment. That doesn't include the number of people that are silently suffering. When you mm. think about it, children are actually more prone to develop mental health issues than adults are because they don't have either cognition in terms of being able to process things. They don't have the protective factors yet mm. and they don't have the resilience take that and take away the one thing that teaches them the most. So children have one primary responsibility growing up. They, they learn through play and socialization. Mm -hmm. What is COVID taking away from kids? Their ability to play with other people or interact and socialize with other people. And it's just changed their whole world. That would tell you by itself that those numbers for them being at risk for depression, suicide, and anxiety have spiked but you're literally talking about nearly 7 million plus people suffering mm -hmm. with mental health issues. And, and literally there's a statistic when I was at Rutgers that talked about, it takes one of us nearly five plus years to get trained to help somebody. So wow. that, that's, so eat during that time frame that they're trying to get us qualified enough to help you. People are still having challenges and issues and still trying to find and, or, kind of mask the reality that they're struggling with something they may not understand. But to me, I think one of the biggest things is we just don't talk about it enough in our communities. Like it, it's a, it's a, nah, man, I'm good. Like, nah, like, like, nah, like there are a number of things that can create anxiety as well as depressive symptoms. It could be situational. It could be a number of things. And the thing is, and I, I kind of do some other work with uh, divorce and separation. And one of the interesting things that always talks about is we just do not check in enough with our kids. We just don't. We're letting everything else monitor our children. and We're just not checking in. Make it as simple as when is the last time you literally sat down with your family, had Sunday dinner with no electronic devices, people mm -hmm a eye contact and had open conversation about what's going on with them. That's a check-in. Like I haven't, I haven't seen you. I haven't really touched bases with you. That allows me to look into the eyes of my children, my spouse, my significant other or whomever. And like families have just gotten away from that. Like, yeah. like, like they used to call it back in the day, Sunday dinner at big mama's house. Like they, they didn't, they didn't get away from big mama's house and whether we know it or not in, in black oh. and communities, that was the first intervention for us. Being able to be at the table at Big Mama's house and Big Mama saying, baby, something don't look right with you. What's going on with you, baby? A Big Mama might not have knew all the words, but Big Mama knew how to check in with us, kind of would yeah. kind of hold her face to our chin and look at mm -hmm. us and like we, we might need to take the baby to the doctors. And like I think because we're unaccustomed to being in each other's space in that way, we're kind of missing the mark and some of us are silently suffering when we need people in our family more mm -hmm. than others to check in with us first. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's good. Thank you. So that's really good. So Aaron, um, what, what um, can we do as a community to help um, the therapists, the counselors? What can we do as a community? Start talking about it. Mm -hmm. Talk to your kids. Talk to each other. I think mm -hmm. a big part of it is that a lot of times we don't talk about it because it makes us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's so true. I mean, as, as Eric was saying, is that you know, on that having specific times and days. Like well, my family, we eat together all the time. And now as the kids are getting a little older, I have to remind them look, we still eat together. It's not just grab your plate and eat and then you go, no, let's have a specific time because all our schedules are different. So we mm -hmm. have to have conversations. I have to constantly remind them that we need to eat together. Put your phone down. If you don't, if I see you, we turn the phone over. So if I see you touch it and turn it over, then it's being taken. I don't care how old you are because we need that time, as Eric was saying, to just check in and check up. And we should be able as parents to pick up when something doesn't look right. But thank you so much for that, for the community. What else could we do, Eric, as a community? Um, 
uh, <clears throat> when you have those conversations and something seems to be beyond your understanding, the next thing you need to do, either take your child to the pediatrician for a checkup and or you can go to places like Child Inc. And there are a number of other places to provide counseling for youth. But you need to kind of go and get them a, a physical checkup to make sure it's not something physical going on with them. And mm -hmm. then they'll kind of refer you to some place if it's something psychological or mental going on with them. But mm -hmm. like the thing is, you, if you're not doing the check-in, you can't get to the checkup. Mm -hmm. If you can't get to that one more time. You're not doing the check-in, <laughs> sitting down, having dinner, everybody kind of touching bases, looking. So that's the check-in. If I don't do the check-in, I don't know my child needs a check-up. Check-up is I go to the doctor, the doctor rules out that there's nothing physical going on with my child, and I may now need to take them to see a counselor because whatever is going on with them may be based upon uh, them having distorted thoughts, them suffering with anxiety. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the checking order of how you do it. Okay, that was great. So we're talking about the kids. Let's jump to the adults now. We talked about depression a lot. We didn't get to anxiety. I guess anxiety um, will, can lead to depression. Um, but what other uh, mental health issues you think we should talk about that's, that's just really important, especially during this pandemic? I know parents are telling me they can't wait till their kids go back to school. <laughs> I know some parents are, they're like, um, can you just go ride your bike or can you, you go, go join the army or do, do something, you know, and even the parents. So talk about the parents, the stress of the parents they're dealing with that perhaps they have lost their jobs or having, you know, marital challenges or being stuck to a computer, you know, eight hours of the day. How was that affecting what you've been in your experience? Um, from the from March till now, dealing with parents that are um, in counseling virtually. Shoo. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my oh, my second daughter told me as soon as the pandemic happened, she said, "Mom, you're going to think this is funny, but let me tell you, there's going to be a lot of divorces between yeah. now mm -hmm. and next year." She said because yeah. adults couples have not spent this much time together you know, since they probably got married. So now that they are confined to this house and this room and that room, maybe the 10 rooms that they can go to, but that's it, they can't leave the house. Only thing they can do is go to drive to Wawa, that there's going to be some challenges. So talk about what you've been experiencing. Um, I would say counseling us as adults. Uh, I'll say this. I think the pandemic in terms of adult relationships has exposed the spiritual deficits we were unwilling to work on. Mm. Like, and, and the reality is, uh, when you look at counseling, they always talk about it being a biopsychosocial spiritual model. The, the reality is we'll kind of focus on getting our health together. You know, some even transition to kind of, you know, my eating, my this, that, and the third. And then some will kind of look at their relationships. But a lot of people don't start with, Maybe I'm struggling mentally and some of the things I think aren't correct. There's a there's a form of checking in with somebody where you're doing reality testing. You're basically checking mm -hmm. in to make sure that your thoughts are still kind of aligned or correct. Or are you all over the place? Like in one of the things adults struggle with to me from what I've seen since the pandemic is uh we kind of get taught this thing that we should be able to run through a brick wall when we need to be teaching people that it's okay to break down and not be able to figure it out right now. <laughs> like, That's hard for some people. It, it, but while it's hard for some people, it's creating distress in your family. You trying to act like you can carry the world is hurting your family at the end of the day. The reality is part of being a family unit is I don't always got to uphold everything by myself. If I spread the weight of what I have to carry appropriately, it may just be somebody loving on me in my household. Like I have a grandson, man, this is the deepest kid I've ever met in my life. He he hugs me to life, hugs me to life. Like, and what it is, is he misses social contact so much that when he comes around me, he just lays all on me. Now, mind you, I'm not even used to all that, but all I could do is just laugh because the sensation 
of him touching me on a consistent basis changes the chemicals over in my in my brain and it allows me to relax more but that's not how i was raised i remember the first time he did it i'm like man what's wrong with this kid why he hugging me you know what i mean but the, when the reality is i need that level of tenderness in my life because the reality is i'm not getting it in other places because the reality is pandemic this pandemic has basically restricted how we can interact with people. Mm -hmm. Like touch is one of the most uh, pronounced things that we need to experience as adults. And outside of if you're in a relationship with a mate or married, how much touch are you actually getting now? Yeah, everybody keeps talking about we're closed in. Touch is a powerful dynamic. For example, hug somebody today and save a life. Like it, people laugh at stuff like that, but I ain't never seen nobody break bad after getting a hug. <laughs> <laughs> He's a comedian tonight and a doctor, <laughs> Dr. Doctor, Dr. Aaron. So um, that, that was really good um, because, you know, we as parents and, and as adults, if you don't have any children, you can you don't have to have children to deal with uh, mental um, health challenges. So, Aaron, um, what what advice would you give to us adults that perhaps need to go get counseling but have not made that phone call or you know looked in the phone book or we don't even have phone books anymore and and, the, and the, on google and, and tried to research to get help um i think a big part of it is coming to terms with just being okay that you're not okay being okay with okay. Mm -hmm needing help sometimes that like like eric said you can't do it on your own you can't hold the weight of the world on your shoulders and we're not supposed to mm -hmm. that's not our purpose you know we're supposed to do it together the humans are social beings we're so supposed to help each other and be social so i think like you know even in my own experience like a lot of it for me was just knowing that like it's okay to not be okay and it's okay to need help so mm -hmm. i think a big part of it is understanding that like you're not the only one and sometimes especially in the world we live in right now with covid man like everyone needs some help right now mm -hmm. like there's nothing wrong with that okay that's wonderful i don't know if, if our audience have any questions if you have any questions for our um, expert doctors please 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 type it in so we can ask them the question um so begin to type in the question so we can um they can answer it for us. But Eric just mentioned something that's the spiritual side, but I want to talk to Dr. Tim, who is a pastor, about um, the spiritual side of how we deal with mental illness and how, how it's important in this time that I think people should get, you know, spiritual counseling and, you know, the other side, I don't know if we call it professional counseling. Not, not that the spiritual counseling is not professional, but from someone is, is you understand what I mean. Hopefully everybody understands what I mean. So I think this both is needed. Um, so Dr. Tim, tell us how, well, welcome to the Lady Mo evening show, first of all. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Yes, I he's, can. He's oh, okay. You didn't respond. Yes, okay. So, yes, so tell us what it's like, because uh, you are a pastor, tell us what it's like to counsel someone that you know they need something more than what you will you're going to give them well you know um can y'all hear me can you hear me yes we can hear you okay um well i had a conversation with some uh uh so i did a teen workshop yesterday and i was talking and we played the movie antoine fisher and then if anybody knows about them movie Antoine Fisher he had some emotional issues uh based on his background and and things like that and we transitioned into a conversation of because he at his, at, at his juncture when he was being counseled by Denzel Washington um he was uh, very aggressive and rebellious and he shut down for the first three sessions and wouldn't say nothing and so my question to the kids was um how do you recognize when you need help? How do you know when you need help? And what I got from that was, you know, um, we need, we, 
what COVID is really showing us is that we desperately need human connection. Um, it's it's the key to our, our our lifeblood. We need conversation. We need fruitful conversation. And as an educator, um, even with some of the students that I'm teaching, um, there have been times where I do a Zoom, and because I, I have a spiritual acronym, I recognize I can't teach. I teach business education. I can't go into the business education stuff right now because they need to talk. And some days mm -hmm. I didn't even teach the lesson plan, but I just said, okay, how how you doing? Because they need connection. And I started making connection with them before I started teaching them anything. And so in a nutshell, uh, we have to talk to our children. Uh, it The COVID thing is really opening up our eyes that we need conversation uh we we need to be having open in conversation with our children um uh, and to get them into a place and even even adults because conversation is so therapeutic uh, i i think just talking about how you're feeling is so therapeutic I, and, th and from a spiritual side i mean the bible talks about you know talking and and conversing and how how ther therapeutic it is healing of the soul takes place through uh communication and release and sometimes we have to be able to articulate that even if it's just with a few words okay so I, I think i'm i'm big i'm big now on you know let's talk and and, and let's get let's get this out let's um discover what the solutions are together and um, tell me how you're feeling. I like what you guys said earlier. That I think Aaron, you said it, it's okay uh, to be not okay. You, you, you know, uh, tell me what's going on. You know, uh, and if we take that approach, it's kind of the beginning process of being healed. You know, I'm not I'm not abnormal. I'm human, and I'm feeling these emotions that I don't even know how to process. I don't even know what I need. You know. And so that's why, you know, uh, even for adults, we have to recognize uh, because depression and anxiety and all that gets to built up. We have, as adults, we have to recognize our own body warning signs. When do I need to say, uncle, somebody help me? You know, I, I need some help. I think we need to <laughs> we need to plaster that phrase <laughs> into people that we counsel. It's OK to say, I oh, yes, need okay. help. I need help. I do remember, Dr. Tim, years ago, um, maybe about year 2000 or maybe 1999, when you were unemployed for the first time and you were such in such a shock that this had happened to you, that you, you sat in the floor in this one particular area every day for a good two months until I dragged you out of that spot and started vacuuming. Um, and it took you uh, a minute to recover from that. And many people, Aaron and Eric, don't recover from a loss or don't recover from well, as quick as we would like to recover from a loss or a relationship or something that disappointed you, a death. You know, so um, so many of us are dealing with lost and things that happened previously that it's hard for us. We just, be, we just keep moving. We just keep moving. And now that because of the COVID, we have to stay still. We get a chance to look at us and realize that we weren't really as happy as we thought we were. We were just working and, and living the daily life when we really have some challenges. So I, I am very, um, Oh, someone's asking. I'm very, uh, I'm thinking about your time. I'm very, I was sort of looking for it just that fast. It went conscious of your time. So um, we. I, I don't want to keep you all night because it's only supposed to be 45 minutes. But I want to thank you so much. Um, someone is speaking to me in a different language. And I'm so sorry. I can't understand. I don't speak that language. I don't know what language. I don't know if it's a question. But but any last words that you you would like to impart into children or the parents on how to get through this pandemic. I personally like the pandemic, not because, of course, not because people are transitioning. 
I like it because we have no choice but to spend quality time with each other. There's no rushing. I don't have to run to this event, to that event, to do this because everything is closed. Now it's beginning to open. And I think we, we have neglected our family a lot and neglected ourselves um, and stumped our growth in life by moving so much. And I know we have to work and we have to do certain things, but I think our eyes are open now and to, to recognize what's more important and that's family and, you know, forgiveness and things like that, that will hold us back and, and, and keep us in that state of depression. So Aaron and Eric, um, I'm going to um, let you say whatever you would like to say to our audience on um, anything dealing with mental health. Eric, you want to go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just say this. Um, <clears throat> maybe about a year ago, a very good friend of mine lost his daughter to suicide. Uh, I remember hearing about it, but I remember going to the funeral. And I, I would say I'm above average resilient. The sadness and the despair of losing someone that young was so profound. And it kind of made me look at one of the things we don't talk about is how high the suicide rate is amongst basically adolescents or youth. Actually, the rate is it's the second leading cause of death amongst youth, suicide. Yep. Mm -hmm. and the, we don't educate ourselves. For example, five quick points. One, you have to have conversation. You have to be willing to talk to your children in an unbiased manner about do you do you uh, want to hurt yourself or are you are you uh, suicidal? Part of the, the other step, which is kind of like step three is you need to figure out in that conversation based on how they respond, they actually have a plan. Do they have a plan? So when you ask them and they're like, no, you need to continue the conversation to see what their plan is. Like, do they actually have a plan? The number two thing is probably the most important thing, and this is an area we need to improve on as parents, and I'm, I'm talking to myself. We got to stop making promises to our kids that we're unable to keep. Like, that's hurting our children. We're making, I'm going to do this. We going, like, this has impacted each of us in a way where, where we're emotionally fatigued. Emotional fatigue drains your energy and it causes you to kind of have to rest or disconnect from people more than you normally would. So, like, if you make a promise, make sure you can keep it with your kids because that's traumatizing for children. For someone that they trust to say that they're going to do something and to be unwilling or unable to follow through with it mm. and not to have conversation about it is impactful for kids. Like, it's the worst thing ever. Like, we keep thinking that it's not because we're adults, but it is. Imagine mm -hmm. how we feel when somebody says they're going to do something for us and don't follow through. The other one we already talked about was the check in and the check up. And then kind of the last thing is you, you got to kind of be okay with your children not being okay. Like, I think we want to always make things okay for our kids. And the reality is we're a guide in their lives. If we don't show them how to deal with some of the adversity that they're going to have to face, then the reality is they won't be prepared to do what is necessary to live the life that they desire. Mm -hmm. The final thing, which is kind of like 5A, you need to kind of uh, look around your house and make sure that you don't have things that are accessible because children get impulsive when they think about suicide. So if there's a bunch of Tylenol pills with your non-prescription laying around, they might swallow a bunch of them. Like, while we don't think we should lock those things up, you should. Tylenol, bare aspirin, uh, codeine, things, lock that stuff up. You know what I mean? If you have a gun in a house, make sure it's secured. Like, those type of things become important because if they have access to lethal means, they're going to be impulsive sometime and not really mean to in the moment and basically put themselves at risk. And you can end up regretting not simply buying a lockbox keeping all the medication in a lockbox, making sure that you're throwing away old prescriptions and things like that. Again, kids are impulsive. 
the thing that keeps them from being impulsive is socialization and social interaction. They're not getting a lot of that, so they're going to be susceptible and at risk to have uh, mood swings, get anxious, and at times deal with situational depression. If you think they're getting on your nerves, you might need to look at the fact we get on kids' nerves too. they human beings too. We get on kids' nerves too. That's what I done got in touch with during the pandemic. I get on my kids' nerves. <laughs> True. Thank you. <laughs> That's so great. Yes, thank you. I'll type those those points in for everybody later. Aaron, I don't know how I'm going to follow that up. Let's be real. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree with uh, everything Eric just said, and I think it it's really important. He kind of went over the steps of you know when when someone is appearing really depressed or possibly suicidal in asking those questions, you know, are you having thoughts of wanting to hurt yourself or kill yourself and asking, do you have a plan? Have you thought about how you want to do it? And then seeing kind of, you know, do they have access to things that they could use to do it with? Um, mm -hmm. I think the biggest part too is, you know, if someone is in that state, don't leave them alone. They should never be alone. Mm -hmm. you, you need to get them help immediately. Mm, yes. Don't leave them alone. Wow. Okay. That, that's good. Don't leave him alone. I was just thinking about, oh, what's his name? Oh, Hathaway, Donnie Hathaway, that he was, his wife said he was always, she was always with him when he traveled because he dealt with schizophrenia and, you know, bipolar. Um, and she said he went by himself this one time and that was the last time. So, you know, that I, I love that. Don't leave them alone. So we as parents and adults watch our family um, even seniors get depressed as well. And, and their coping is they don't eat or they don't take their medication. Um, so I would like to end with just a short prayer because there's so many people that are hurting um, and, and dealing with mental illness or mental health. And we just want to say a short prayer for those that are listening that um, need to just push themselves to get counseling, to just look at themselves in the mirror and say, it's okay, I'm not feeling okay. Um, and so those parents who need to do a check-in with their children to get a checkup. And those people right now, those that are unemployed and looking for work um, on unemployment, getting as much help as they can, or maybe not enough help. So that can send you, send you to, you know, send you through uh, a situation where you can be attacked by uh, depression or anxiety or bipolar and things like that. So we're just going to say a short prayer. And I thank you all so much for tuning in um, to the Lady Mo evening show. Next week, next Thursday, we'll be talking about human trafficking. And I have my guest has been saved from human trafficking. trafficking. So she's going to be sharing her story and telling us what, her, what it was like to be trafficked, trafficked and how her life is so different now and what we should be aware of. January was, was human trafficking um, month, but I wanted to wait until February. I, I kind of want to just look and see what things are going on in January to start off in February. So I thank you all so much for tuning in. Please uh, join me on, uh, usually on in the mornings and sometimes on Tuesday evening, but definitely on Thursday evenings. So we're going to end with prayer. If you have questions, Aaron and Eric, please tell everyone how to get in contact with you. I'll, I'll send the information to you later. You want, you want to type it in? Okay. All, All right. right. No, what you can, I was going to type it in for you. We're going to type it in for you. So that way people would have it if they want to contact your office. They want to contact your office. Aaron, how about you start first while we wait for? Um, I'll probably end up doing the same because I'll have to oh. get that information to you. <laughs> well, if you can, please go back in the video and you'll see the video and go back in the comments and type it in. Uh, yeah. So that way everyone will have it. I just wanted to type it in right now, but that's okay. Um, as long as you go back in and put that information in so people can call you um, and set up an appointment to see your availability if you can assist me. We thank you so much um, for you coming in tonight, you know, coming on, and I really appreciate you giving us understanding about mental health and what we need to do as parents, what we need to do as adults, 
how we can help use others that are around us. So we thank you. So we're going to just end with a short prayer. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, we we pray tonight that your your spirit would touch uh, our young people in a special way that are being challenged with uh, mental issues, mental challenges, and that you would uh, guide them into a safe place. You said in your word that our children, the, the, the seed of the righteous, our children will have a place of refuge. And we pray that they would begin to notice the refuge, the, the people in their lives that can bring help. Touch us as parents to be more sensitive and be more cognizant of when we need to reach out and start a conversation with our children. Equip us by your word tonight and may your loving hand wrap around us tonight and comfort us in our very time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all so much for tuning in to the Lady Mo um, show, evening show. And, you know, it's been, it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. And I appreciate all of you that have tuned in who um, just, I know you have just gotten so much knowledge and understanding. I know you feel, you feel, different now and you feel that it's okay it really is okay now it's okay so please reach out to aaron and reach out to eric i'm sure they would they can set up an appointment um, with your insurance if you don't have insurance please talk to them about that maybe they offer you some programs that'll be able to assist you and your children but again thank you so much and i will see you soon thank you for tuning in to the lady mo evening show <laughs>